president of the Print Society here at the Nelson Atkins Museum of Art. Um, and I'd like to, like to thank you all for coming out this evening. Um, first of all, I, I think we need to uh, give special acknowledgement to Robin Gross, who helped put this together, as well as, <laughs> as, well as all of our events for the past three years. Um, without her diligence and attention and patience, uh, we would not be where we are uh, as the Print Society and, and certainly in our programming. So thank you very much. Uh, just a few notes about the Print Society for those of you who are not acquainted with us. Uh, our mission is to support the museum, uh, specifically the, the print department of the museum. We do this in a couple different ways. We purchase prints for the collection. We commission prints from contemporary artists and donate those to the collection. Uh, we also sell those prints and uh, use the money to buy more prints for the collection. Um, our latest commission print is actually sitting out on the table. If you, if you missed it, it's by Doug Osa. And is Doug in here right now? You'll, you, well, you'll get a, he's, he's outside. You'll get a chance to meet him if you, if you care to. Um, we also, uh, uh, part of our mission is to promote and uh, interest in and awareness of prints. Uh, that's where events like tonight come from. Um, and the other thing that we do is support the local art community. So we support galleries, we support artists in various ways. Uh, please stop by after the lecture to ask questions, buy the commission print, sign up for a membership, Anything, uh, and you know, if you have any questions, please let us know. Uh, and now, uh, let me introduce Dr. Goddard. Dr. Stephen H. Goddard has, since 1984, been a professor of art history at the University of Kansas and curator of prints and drawings at the Spencer Museum of Art at the University of Kansas. He is now also serving as senior curator at the Spencer Museum. He earned his bachelor's from Grinnell College and his master's and PhD from Iowa City, or excuse me, from University of Iowa. Um, and he had his postdoctoral internship at Yale University. Dr. Goddard is trained in printmaking as well as art history and is a past president of the Print Council of America. His research and exhibitions often focus on his interest in the connections between science and art, and also on the role of prints and multiples in society. Today, Dr. Goddard will be speaking on Machine in a Void, World War I, and the Graphic Arts. Uh, this stems from an exhibition that was done at the Spencer Museum, which included 150 works by artists such as Henry de Groo, Otto Dix, George Grosch, Eric Heckel, and Carl schmidt Rotluf. Uh, the focus of the exhibition was the transcendent vision of the artist uh, as uh, kind of in opposition to nationalistic and propagandic, propagandistic works at the time. So please help me in joining, or in welcoming Dr. Goddard. Well, um, thank you very much, Justin. I'd, I'd like to, to thank you and, and Beth Lurie and Robin Gross and, and others of you in the Print Society for inviting me to speak here tonight. It's a delight to be here. And um, I'm going to show you, uh, while I do a little introductory stuff, this image by Eric Heckel called Park Zay of 1914, just as a sort of backdrop while I just clarify a couple things. Um, first of all, the comments I'll make tonight are um, drawn from the places where I've done research. Um, so I'm, I'm trying to give um, an overview of, of what I've experienced in studying printmaking in World War I. Um, but of course, it's drawn specifically from those venues that I know best. So I've, I've done research in Antwerp, uh, Berlin, Brussels, Dresden, uh, Freiburg, Kansas City, uh, this is alphabetical order, not geographic. <laughs> uh, Karlsruhe, uh, Los Angeles, New Haven, 
Miami, New York, Nuremberg, St. Louis, Stuttgart, and a small town in the Vosges Mountains. But I have not done an obvious things like go to the Imperial War Museum in London. Um, so if there's a slight uh, uh, kind of tilt towards German graphics, um, that's one reason. It has to do with the places I visited, not, not any um, other agenda. Um, I didn't do an actual count, but I think about four-fifths of the things I show you tonight um, are in our collection at the Spencer Museum of Art. And uh, before I forget, I want to just extend an invitation. You're all welcome to come on, on Fridays. We're generally open from uh, 10 to 12 and 1 to 4 in the afternoons for anyone who just wants to come in and look at prints with, without making prior arrangement. Call it, uh, uh, you know, welcome, you know, drop-ins welcome Fridays. So you're always welcome, if you're in Lawrence on a Friday, to come by and look at prints. Um, I also should make clear that I'm not a historian of the First World War or a military historian. Uh, my curiosity about this material was piqued by the observation that many art history texts seem to end in 1914, while others tend to start in 1918. And a natural question for me was, well, what happened in printmaking between 1914 and 1918? The earth didn't stand still, even if it was at war. Um, so, you know, I think that we're all aware of, of kind of well-known posters and works by a few of the German expressionists that were made during the war years. But I was very curious what else might be out there. And um, it turned out that there's an absolute mountain of prints that was made during the war, and coming to grips with it is, is uh, difficult. It probably won't make it my, my uh, life's passion or project, but it's occupied me for a couple years, and I, I don't think I'm quite done yet. Um, so, for example, my own folder of study photographs I've made on these trips has well over 4,000 items, and I'm sure that that's just the beginning. Um, I've seen, I think, over 100 portfolios of prints made during the war years in various countries. Um, so, uh, one other thing, I'm working with a kind of two computers here, so I have to um, coordinate a little bit, so excuse me if I tie myself in knots once or twice tonight, I'll, I'll try not to do that. Um, so this evening I want to focus on the major themes that emerge uh, from this enormous um, body of material. And let's see, let's get that one. In the 1980s, uh, one of my major projects was an exhibition about the Belgian avant-garde and, and an artist group called Les Vant, or the 20. Um, in the process of working on this exhibition, I became intrigued with a Belgian artist, Henri de Gru, who was a friend of James Enzer and given to heroic Christian and Wagnerian themes, so basically a symbolist artist, such as this lithograph of around 1899 showing the death of Siegfried. My interest in printmaking during World War I really started in earnest when I encountered by chance a cache of 53 proofs by Henri de Gru for a little known portfolio of 40 etchings on the theme of the war. The portfolio, Le Visage de la Victoire, or The Face of Victory, is an amazing outpouring that was published about halfway through the war in 1916. You're looking at the censored title page for the Visage de la Victoire, uh, titled The Eclipse, a proof impression that may be unique in the world at the Spencer. I'm not really certain of that. There had, in fact, been a total eclipse of the sun on August 21, 1914, just as the war was breaking out. It shows a Medusa-like death's head uh, beginning to eclipse the head of Christ, so hardly a patriotic call to arms. In his preface to the portfolio, um, which exists in two or three copies only that I'm aware of. Um, there's a, a printed text that's, that's quite useful. And in that text, he described the war as, quote, an undeniable and colossal absurdity like a machine functioning in a void and an opulent excess of perfect horror. And that's where we took our title for the uh, 2010 exhibition on the war. An article in Popular Astronomy in 1916 mentions the 1914 eclipse that, uh, this, that the uh, censored title page that we just saw alludes to. And uh, to quote the article, it mentions a comet which will hold the name the Comet of War 
uh, has been visible the entire year in the sky, discovered in December 1913 by Delavan at the uh, Plata Observatory. It is still visible at this time and will be for five years. So this is one of three versions of the Gru's composition of the uh, Comet of War. With no doubt, um, this refers to the comet that was just described in the, uh, in the Astronomical Journal. Um, and these are not included in the published version of the portfolio, so these also may be uh, unique. I'm not certain again. Um, the published portfolio had 40 prints. We have 53 proofs. Some of them are duplicates. So some of them show things not on the portfolio, and, so, and our proofs don't have absolutely everything that actually went into the portfolio. So it appears to be a stash of working material from DeGruy's studio. And since you're, you're print people, you'll, you'll appreciate the fact that they're kind of dirty and smudgy. They're beautifully printed um, with a lot, of, uh, a lot of character and variant proofs, uh, different papers, uh, and a lot of coffee stains and wine stains and doodles and things like that as well. So they're, they're very rich, uh, rather wonderful images. So before really starting on these basic themes, I'll just go through some of this portfolio. It shows things like uh, a grenade thrower, who's seen here with a kind of impromptu gas mask and these marvelous uh, clouds surrounding him. These are uh, soldiers wearing uh, gas masks, various varieties of, of uh, kind of, it looks like deep sea diver equipment for protection from poison gas. I'm just going to show you a few of these things from this group. I want to give a broader view. It's a very unusual etching that shows um, a man with a uh, flamethrower on his back. And there's a scene of the arrest of a German soldier you know, reaching a, a prisoner of war. And this rather garish poster here of November 1916 announces that uh, at that time, at the Gallery Le Bottier uh, in Paris, there was an exhibition of 279 paintings, pastels, drawings, sculptural works, and etchings, and lithographs by de Gru. So you imagine that in the few first years of the war, he had created almost 300 works of art that went into this exhibition. Uh, so it's an enormous outpouring. Uh, he was living in Paris at this time, and we know that he sometimes worked from photographs in magazines and reportage, and that he sometimes um, may have worked from firsthand experience. That has not been demonstrated, but it's been brought up many times as a possibility. So anyway, this was my entry into um, World War I, was discovering this portfolio, uh, deciding it was important for us to have, finding a way to bring it to the university, and then digging in and starting to study these things. So if we turn to some of the major themes. Um, the subject of grenades, shells, and, and craters is, is, is a major one. This is Max Beckman's Grenade of 1915, published a little later in 1918, um, that shows this bursting grenade in the sort of upper right-hand corner and uh, figures uh, who have already sustained some kind of damage from, from shrapnel. This is a drawing by Otto Dieks called Grenade of 1918, but done you know, before the end of the war. Um, he drew extensively while he was a soldier. Um, if you're not familiar with Deeks's work, he did a fabulous portfolio on the war uh, after the events of the war, um, drawing extensively from his experiences. He uh, felt a real urge to remain in the war, although he was very much uh, against it, uh, but he was drawn to the experience. Uh, he said, the war was a horrible thing, but there was something tremendous about it, too. I don't want to miss it in any price. To have been, you, know, you have to have seen human beings in this unleashed state to know what human nature is. So this is a rather rare work, and that is a, uh, a drawing done actually during the war years, not one of his works looking back to his experience done later in the 1920s. This is the work by the Belgian artist Franz Mazarel, who um, was active in many parts of Europe um, during the war. I think he was primarily in neutral countries, uh, very much anti-war. Um, he published in a number of newspapers, uh, Les Tablettes, Demain, and Le Foy, 
and he um, also made a portfolio on the subject called Debu Mort. So this is an image from Demain of 1917 that shows uh, one of these uh, large blasts with figures uh, flying through the air, not unlike Deeks's drawing, which Deeks's has a little more authority from having been firsthand, but this was a theme that was repeated again and again. Um, here's an example by Max Pechstein um, from his portfolio on the sum of uh, 1918. This battle was, of course, one of the bloodiest in the war, resulting in over a million casualties. Uh, the tank figured prominently in the battle uh, of the sum, but I'm not aware of any really major prints that feature the tank as a subject. It may be lurking somewhere else, but I haven't found them yet. Felix Vallaton, the Swiss artist who was active in Paris most of his life, um, did a, a portfolio of six prints called C'est la guerre, uh, which of course is a pun on the war. Um, it was done in the winter of 1915-16 and published in 1917. And you might note at the bottom those little uh, semicircles and spikes are, are no doubt helmeted figures with bayonets in the trenches. Another um, French artist, André Devambez, um, did a rather remarkable por portfolio called 12 Etchings, uh, Scenes from the War of 1915 to 17. This one is titled Shell Holes. I'm giving you English titles throughout just to make life easy. And if you look closely, you can see that the craters are filled with soldiers, small figures huddling inside. Also from 12 etchings, this is a print called Cold. And you can see, oops, the, um, basically the same subject, but here not hiding so much from munitions and explosions, but hiding from the cold. And this is the uh, uh, British artist, um, whose name I didn't put in here. Um, I think it may be McVeigh, but I did not uh, get my identification in this. Yeah, it looks like right there, James McVeigh. Uh, remarkable scene with shell holes in the foreground and blasted landscape. This is a preparatory, preparatory drawing by Otto Deeks uh, called Flooded Craters that uh, is undated, but was done in preparation for his big war portfolio, which he's tremendously famous for. And since you are um, print crew, sorry about that, you can see in the lower left, there's a little inscription that says watery aquatint. So we're quite certain that this is a preparatory work for, for a print. And this is by C.R.W. Nevinson, the British artist, described as who's here describing a nearly identical view with the one you just saw, with water quilled craters and a mud and devastated landscape, um, but of course seen from the other side uh, of the trenches. This is a lithograph of 1918 called um, After a Push. As an aside, when I was in Belgium in 2009, a dear friend who recently passed away, Robert Jose, uh, then director of the Museum of Fine Arts in Ghent, took me on an unanticipated driving tour. We visited a contemporary art event with installations in a small village, uh, Watu, and knowing I was working on images of World War I, he pointed to this pond and said, it was probably a bomb crater from the First World War. So these kinds of geographic memory are still all over the European continent, as, as you probably know. The uh, air war was also a major theme in printmaking, such as this brilliant um, contrast of new technology and blasted trees by C.R.W. Nevinson, a print of 1917. One of the major uh, wartime series was um, with individual portfolios by many artists was uh, titled The Great War, Britain's Efforts and Ideals and it included one portfolio by C.R.W. Nevinson uh, titled Building Aircraft, and includes this masterful composition titled Banking at 4,000 Feet, a print of 1917, published in 1918. 
And from Otto Dix's Krieg, or War, this is an etching of an air raid, uh, Lenz being bombed of 1924, but like all of Dix's works, drawn from his personal experience as a combat soldier in the war. Oh, sorry, there it is. So this is Otto Dix. Remarkably, the Russian avant-garde artist Natalia Goncharova produced a portfolio in 1914 titled Mystical Images of War, 14 Lithographs, which includes this astonishing image titled Angels in Airplanes, uh, which is a sort of mashup of um, new flying machines and is also reminiscent of the iconography of, of the Orthodox Church and Orthodox icons. French airman and artist Maurice Bousset uh, produced three known portfolios dedicated to the role of aircraft in World War I. Um, one is called At the Time of the Gothas, um, Paris Bombed, which had two etchings and 13 woodcuts of 1918. Uh, one was called In Aircraft, Flights and Combats, with 25 lithographs of 1919. And a third was called Our Squadrons During the Great War, which had made of 20 uh, color woodcuts. And this is the cover for that one that you see here, known as Escadrille. Um, Bousset, uh, who studied art in Paris, began military service as an aerial scout in 1914. His introductory text to the third portfolio, uh, Our Squadrons, the cover of which you see here, um, states, and this is a quote from Bousset. Between flights in the cockpit of the twin motor, under canvas hangers, winter evenings, under the glow of Watchman's lantern, these images were carved during the turbulent period of the Great War. A block of cherry or beech, a steel knife, were companions who never abandoned the author in those years when the future no longer existed for the soldier. So he, if we accept his testimony, he's saying that he's carving away during the war years, which I have no reason to doubt. <laughs> That's right. So these are hands of woodcut, so I can't resist showing you a couple of them. I think I've got four of them here. This is mechanics carrying a rotary engine, and the aesthetic of the engine and the airplane is a whole different but interesting topic. Uh, I think Marcel Duchamp commented on a, he was, I think, standing with Brancusi, I may have this anecdote wrong, looking at sculpture together. Um, and uh, later they were looking at a, at a propeller, a large propeller that it was on display. And um, he commented, Duchamp commented that, why do we need sculpture anymore? There's nothing more beautiful than this propeller. <laughs> <laughs> so the aesthetic of, of the machine is, is a very real one uh, that comes into view at this time. And the rotary engine is, is one such a rather seductive device. Here's an air battle uh, called Twin Engine G4, an albatross in a fight. Uh, you notice also that it says photo on the nose of the aircraft there. It's probably used for reconnaissance as well. It's one of the major uses of aircraft in the war was just to see what's going on and report back. Also by Bousset, uh, this is a monoplane uh, Moraine Saulnier attacking um, a German aircraft. And finally, this is the end of a Taube, of a German, the name for the German aircraft, from his portfolio on the bombardment of Paris. Oh, I apologize. So there's the two previous in combat. And this is the, the last one I'll show you from this set. I also want to mention um, another uh, example from his other uh, portfolio uh, of Paris bombarded. Um, this one is not um, uh, entirely hand printed. I think some of this is hand colored. And it's a plate six that shows aerial guns of the defense in the fight over, uh, flight over the city of Paris. 
rather spectacular composition. We'll see one or two more of his prints later. So, there we go. Um, illustrations of um, the outcome of some air battles were, were common. Uh, I'll show you two of them from a German magazine periodical called Wachtfeuer. It literally means watch fire. Uh, this one's title is Air Battle and is dated to 1917. And another from the same journal simply titled A Bad Crash. And I show these because it's one way of introducing a very interesting artist, uh, Robert Mickle. There we go. Who served as a pilot and uh, survived a crash in his airplane that he was testing in 1916 and reportedly picked up pieces of the ruined machine after the crash. Uh, he recovered from the crash in a hospital nearby uh, in Weimar and attended the nearby Hochschule for Bildung und Kunst, the Academy of Fine Art, which would become uh, the Bauhaus in 1919, uh, a very important uh, center for the arts. Um, the crash and experience of coming to amidst aircraft uh, wreckage reportedly made a really strong impression, as you can imagine, on, on this man and on his art. Um, as a woodcut, as in this woodcut printed with silver ink on black paper, uh, clearly shows. This is uh, from his series MEZ, which stands for Middle Europeish Site or Middle European, Central European Time um, of 1919 to 1920. It's impossible to get a sense of the silver ink with that, unfortunately. It's a beautiful print. Um, occasionally, one encounters prints um, that describe industrial ruin, such as this work by Ferdinand Spiegel, um, made in the vicinity of Charleroi, uh, from a portfolio of 1914-1915 uh, of 30 images by himself and another artist, uh, Fritz Ehler. Um, the, I don't know why, I haven't had time to investigate this, but the portfolio was dedicated to our, quote, our friends in Lille. I think it's a very striking image, <laughs> only seen it once. <laughs> this issue of um, Dada magazine, although uh, published after the war, was something of an anthology of the group's activities in Zurich at the famous Cabaret Voltaire. During the war years, neutral Switzerland was home to numerous political refugees, including many artists and writers. The Dadas channeled their revolution um, to World War I into an, um, their, their revulsion <laughs> to World War I. They had a revolution too. Um, into a sort of an indictment for the nationalist materialist values that had uh, brought it about. And much like the bombed factory we just saw, they proposed to reduce the world to its constituent parts in order to rebuild a better world. This issue was printed in Zurich shortly after the end of the war, at a time when the Dada movement was emerging with renewed vigor in Berlin, Paris, Hanover, Cologne, and elsewhere. Uh, it includes original prints, uh, predominantly woodcuts by Hans Arp, Viking Egeling, Raoul Hausmann, Marcel Janko, Hans Richter, and text by Pierre Albert Biro and a number of others, and even Jean Cocteau, and the whole thing was edited by Tristan Zara, which are a, a, a litany of uh, very significant names in the Dada movement. Um, and there's a, a lot of consonance between what the Dadas were doing and some of the more progressive artists, such as Robert Mickle that you just saw, or in this case, uh, Johannes Molzahn, um, who did this work called Klingen or Sound in 1919. It's a woodcut with stenciled watercolor. And Molzahn served in the military uh, beginning in 1915, um, yet was able to hold an exhibition in the De Sturm Gallery in Berlin during the war years. Um, so we just commented this print has a lot in common with Mikkel's uh, MEZ as well as with the Dada aesthetic. Um, and it was made in 1919, the same year that uh, 
the artist Molzon published his manifesto of absolute expression in the journal Der Storm. And the personal outpouring of this manifesto has been characterized as highly emotional and mystical texts with apocalyptic passages and an emphasis on destruction and creation. So returning to aircraft um, as, as a kind of wartime theme, um, dirigibles such as the German Zeppelin were sometimes depicted by printmakers as in this work by Maxim Mofra. Uh, this is actually from a portfolio dedicated to the landscape. It's rather unique in that regard. It shows the impact of war on the landscape. And in this one instance in the portfolio, he kind of pans up and looks at the sky and catches this uh, zeppelin caught in the uh, searchlights, basically. Bousset, of course, couldn't resist this topic. <laughs> kind of amazing color woodcut. Um, one of two or three striking images of zeppelins this um, is titled Fleet of Zeppelins Attacking England, 1916. And it was from the portfolio from our squadrons that you saw earlier. <laughs> this is from a little artist book uh, by Guy Arnaud. It's not a, a lot of these are relatively unknown names. Um, with a text by another individual, Roger Boutet de Malval. And um, the whole book is dedicated to the, uh, um, to the idea of zeppelins uh, and, and different aspects of their observation. Um, I'm sorry, that's wrong. This is from a different book. It's from a notebook of a soldier on leave. So it's uh, all kinds of things that have to do with what a soldier might do while on leave, one of which is to um, go outside at night when you're not really supposed to and look for good places to view the zeppelins uh, drifting through the air. This apparently was a pastime in Paris. So this is a work by um, Hans Bastianer. You can tell by the type font that it's a very sort of Teutonic album I'm gonna show you here. 